Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me this morning or evening, wherever it is you are. Um, I know we have uh, some attendees from across the world today. That's pretty exciting. Um, my name is Shannon Holmes. I am a medical physicist with Standard Imaging, um, and I'll be talking today about some of the nuances and challenges that small field dosimetry bring. Um, I've got, make sure, yep, yeah, slides are following. Just want to start by saying thank you to all the frontline workers right now. Um, this is some of our family at Standard Imaging, um, but we know that these, we're living in kind of unprecedented times now. Um, and we at Standard Imaging are proud to be supporting um, specifically these heroes in the clinic, um, both the patients and the staff. Uh, it takes a lot of courage to go in every day to treat cancer, but also to be treated. It's scary enough as a patient um, without adding uh, adding the risk of virus viral infection on top of that, um, but also thank you to the the uh, the workers who are still delivering groceries and uh, and making sure that our nations can function uh, through this crisis. So thank you from our family. A little bit of housekeeping before I get going. Um, we are recording the webinar today, so if you have if you get interrupted, um, if you're in the clinic right now, we know how that goes. Um, we'll send you a recording link and you can see um, what you might have missed or if you want to pass it on to a colleague or, or review it later. Um, that is also, of course, just fine. Um, if you have questions throughout the presentation, please feel free to enter them in the GoToMeeting dialog box. Um, I'll make sure to circle around to those at the end if I don't, uh, if I don't see them during the presentation. So Standard Imaging has been in business for a little over 30 years now. Um, we're based in Middleton, Wisconsin, just outside of Madison, um, and we do design and manufacture a full suite of QA products for radiation therapy. Um, I will be focusing specifically on those small field dosimetry um, detectors today. Uh, I'm not going to go into phantoms just because there's so much, uh, uh, there's only so much I can cover in the time we have. Um, but know that we have the phantoms and, and other things to go with this as well. So today's focus is on detectors. So small fields, what really is the trouble with small fields? And obviously size is the first thing when we're talking about small fields. Um, there's a lot of difficulty just in, in dealing with the size of the field compared to the size of the detector. Um, but some of the other pieces that I'll touch on are the source occlusion, um, when you're blocking the, the primary source with your collimation system, changes in the energy of the field, changes in the penumbra of the field, how do you define field sizes, um, loss of lateral charge particle equilibrium that affects these measurements. And a, a couple of excellent references, I'll be pulling some images and, and discussion from these as well, are this IPEM report 103, small field MV photon dosimetry, as well as a more recently published uh, TRS-483, which was a joint publication from the IAEA and the AAPM on dosimetry of small static fields. Um, and this is an excellent reference for, for um, detector corrections, especially as, as they relate to energies and field size uh, differences. So just to start with a definition, so we're all on the same page of what a small field really is, um, the TRS-483 defines small fields as having at least one of these conditions, either loss of lateral charge particle, particle equilibrium on the, the main axis of the beam, partial occlusion of that primary source by the collimating devices on, on that beam axis, um, and the size and or the size of the detector is similar to or large compared to the beam uh, dimensions. So starting with Physical size is the first of these challenges. Um, generally, small fields are in the range of four to 40 millimeters. Um, and so then the question becomes, how do you define that size? Is it by the jaw setting, your collimation setting, or is it by the full width half max of the field? Um, and understanding how um, you are defining those sizes will help you pick um, which detectors are um, reasonable for your measurements. So with larger fields, um, this is out of the um, the IP or the IPEM report, I think. Um, the, the, with larger fields, the the fifty percent line of the penumbra and the jaw setting match, and so your full width half max and your jaw setting are in agreement. But as you get down to these smaller fields, where the um, penumbra shape from one of the collimators 
um, overlaps with the penumbra shape that would be formed um, without interference by the other collimator, you actually start to widen your full width half max broader than what your collimation setting is. And as you get uh, really small, um, the effect is much more pronounced. So you need to understand that, that, um, that what your jaw setting is stating or your col um, collimation cone may not necessarily match exactly with the, the full width half max or the profile of your field. There's also a decreased output. Um, as this curve decreases, um, you can see it goes down. We know this, These are out, um, we adjust for this via output factors generally, but also to be aware as you're, as you're measuring these fields. Also with small fields, the challenge of the physical size is that um, alignment becomes much more tricky. So a small misalignment really equals a, a very large geometric or dosimetric miss. There's a question that proton beam doesn't have charged particle equilibrium, so do we exclude this consideration for proton? That's a very good question. I'm not an expert on proton beams, and I will admit I'm focusing on um, photon beams here, um, but it's, um, it's a good question. And one I, I can't say I have an answer to offhand. There's my question dialogue. There we go. Um, source occlusion is the next. Um, oops. Oh, I see. Sorry, it's my controls that were blocking the image. So you shouldn't have seen that. Um, source occlusion is the next um, of the, the major challenges with small fields. And this illustration is pretty well known. A lot of you may have seen this. Um, with a larger field, you see the full source profile from where the beam is being generated in the target. Once you get down to these smaller fields, that um, the the view from here of the full source is uh, is truncated. And so that's what we call source occlusion. So both the scatter is reduced as well as the direct fluence uh, from the target. With lateral equilibrium, um, generally the equilibrium condition is that the lateral scattering distance needs to be equal to or greater than the range of electrons. This is a plot um, of the ratio of dose to kerma as energy increases. Um, so to kind of translate that into uh, um, a little bit easier to, to understand terminology, you'll start losing lateral equilibrium when your beam width is less than twice your Dmax, generally. Um, and the higher energies tend to lose this plateau sooner. So as you increase in energy, you, um, you lose that flat region in the middle of the field faster for the same size field. So detector positioning, um, and corrections come into play sooner um, for the higher energies. Um, so it's also, which, which means it's also important that you uh, characterize both the um, profiles as well as the um, output factors so that you can understand that relationship. Detector size, or how do detectors themselves impact measurements? Detector size and shape um, can affect the, the measurement in a number of different ways. The first, of course, is volume averaging. Um, how, what does your field profile look compared to what we like to call the spot size of your detector, um, the, the region that your detector is actually covering? Um, is your, and what's the shape of that, si that spot size? If you've got a, an elongated chamber, um, then you're integrating over different uh, section of the profile in one direction versus the other. So that also can affect your measurement. Um, this plot is from a publication by Meltzner et al. Um, showing the, the active region of a chamber here, but with buildup cap, um, it, it's uh, much wider. And so that you can see the, a little bit uh, more clearly the, uh, on the gamma knife fields, the older gamma knife fields, the, t the wider fields um, were flat over the region of um, lateral charge particle equilibrium for this particular detector, um, but both of the smaller two helmets were not. Um, so positioning, we mentioned, is critical. Um, and then for film, um, if you're looking at very small fields, um, the, the scanner scatter within the scanner can also affect your resolution. So something to, to be aware of if you're using film. Second way that 
detectors um, affect your measurement is, of course, perturbation of the beam when you're placing something in the field um, at the point of measurement that is different from the density of the region around it. Replacing water with the detector, then you um, then you perturb the dose de deposition right there at the point of measurement. Um, so uh, the the plot at the right shows the um, as field sizes decrease. Um, this is the beam quality correction factor. Um, detectors that have lower density require a, a greater than one correction for their under response. Detectors that have a higher uh, density require less than one correction. And I'm sure all of you are familiar with this, but it, it never hurts to go through it again. Um, so questions to ask when you're looking at a detector for these small field measurements. If you're looking at an ion chamber, how big is the air cavity compared to the size of the fields you want to measure? If you're looking at a diode, um, what's the density of that diode? Um, is there built-in compensation that can be good or bad? Um, energy compensation is usually um, inserting um, a lower density region, either an air gap or some other lower density material to compensate for the higher density of the diode. Um, but that's really designed usually for a specific small energy range and outside that energy range, it may be a, a worse detector than a non-compensated diode. So um, be aware of those limitations of your diodes. Um, and how uh, strong that ener their energy dependence may be compensated or not. Um, published corrections are sometimes available for detectors. Um, it's good to go looking for those, but um, remember that if you're going to apply these published corrections, you need to match the published conditions, um, because if the conditions are different, then the corrections may be different as well. So just one of the plots from Paolo Francescan, uh, one of his papers, showing here um, our simulation detector um, and compared to some of the other diodes. Um, and same thing here, uh, this, these were ionization chambers uh, comparisons with the PTW microion. So then next the way that detectors uh, impact your measurement is your signal level. With an ion chamber, um, we all remember signal level is proportional to the collecting volume. And so as you decrease the volume of your ion chamber, your signal decreases. Um, so your signal to noise ratio becomes much more of a concern. Um, and you need to make sure that if you're measuring these very small signals, you have an appropriately sensitive and accurate electrometer. With a diode, you get a much larger signal than from a microionization chambers, but they have their own limitations as well. Signal to noise ratio is something that we need to keep in mind with our detectors as well. Uh, especially when you're looking at a small volume ion chamber, um, making sure that you're, um, you've characterized any leakage you have, um, you have made sure your electrometer has a proper warm up time so that it's stable. Um, you make sure you match the signal strength to the proper electrometer range. If you're measuring a big signal in the low range, you're, um, you're gonna saturate. If you're measuring a low signal in the high range, you're not going to get the accuracy that you're looking for. And one that I learned a couple of years ago um, from one of our engineers is that there are actually some effects from a triaxial cable as well. I mean, I knew about cable-induced signal. If some uh, you don't have a well-shielded cable and you irradiate it, um, you can create some current in there, uh, Compton current from the, the um, central electrode on that uh, cable as well. But there's also a triboelectric effect that can happen if you have a, a more tightly wound cable and you just unwound it. As that cable relaxes, um, it, there are some actually some uh, triboelectric effects of, of current that's released um, in that cable. Um, so something to look for, especially if you're unwinding a cable each time uh, you're doing these measurements, is whether your system is, is able to hold it zero. If it's always drifting, um, it may not actually be your electrometer or your detector, it could be your cable. Um, so it may help to have a cable run through the raceway into the, the room so it doesn't get um, quite as much tightly wound and unwound each time, um, or unwind it early if you can and let it sit and relax. Accuracy of the de detectors also affects your small field measurements. Do you have any energy dependence? Um, we know that diodes have, have a bit of energy dependence due to that change in the density of a diode. 
Um, they'll often um, show an, an excessively low response out of field. So if you're looking at the, the tails um, outside your, your small field, um, you may underestimate the, um, the signal level just outside the field, which could re, uh, lead to an underestimation of the low dose uh, region in your stereotactic patients. We talked about compensated diodes, whether that's good or bad really depends on your setup, what, how you're planning to use it, um, and whether you're matching the conditions that it, it was comp compensated to be uh, stable for. Um, the corrections may be depth dependent because of the energy change as the beam's attenuated by water. And of course, changes in scattered conditions can affect the diode response as well, or, or actually any detector response, if, especially if it has energy dependence. Um, just because the scatter component is a different energy from the primary beam. Um, you should be aware whether your detector has any angular dependence. Um, if it does, you want to make sure you're using it in the orientation for which it was designed. Um, if you're not, then be aware of the higher uncertainty or the implications of using that um, outside the, um, the designed orientation. And then for um, a lot of detectors, ionization chambers in particular, there are dose rate and dose per pulse dependencies as well. Um, so you need to understand at this, uh, for, for this particular um, point, you need to understand both your accelerator behavior, um, how, how that dose per pulse changes as you change your dose rate, um, but you also need to understand the, the um, detector that you're using and how sensitive it is to those changes. Other things, um, I'm not going to go into the, the rest of the list here, but there, uh, you should be aware of leakage from your detector or drift of the detector, how repeatable is your detector, um, what's the resolution, um, can it be calibrated or not, is it a relative detector. Um, I haven't talked much about film or TLDs or OSLs, that sort of thing, um, but every detector has its limitations um, as well as its uh, benefits, its strengths. So what's a physicist to do? There's a lot of stuff to consider here. Uh, sometimes instead of looking at a puzzle, it feels like you're looking more at a ticking time bomb, um, that something's gonna happen, I need to figure out how to make this work. My physician is planning to, um, to implement stereotactic treatments and I have to characterize these beams. So don't panic, <laughs> there are solutions. Um, the options generally for megavoltage photon beams um, are, uh, we have three in-house. Um, one is established technology with known perturbation issues. That would be the diodes. Um, so we have the D1H and the D1V X-rayed and diodes. New technology, um, the W1 and W2 plastic scintillation detectors um, are pretty exciting, especially for small fields. Um, because of their water equivalents, and I'll get into that a little bit more too. And the other um, exciting option that we've had on the market for a number of years now is the old standard, uh, the ionization chamber, but finally working properly in miniature form, and that's the X-ray and A26. Um, and I'll explain what I mean about working properly here in a minute too. So there, there are options. Every detector has both strengths and limitations, um, and the best solution is probably a good combination of detectors so that you can make sure that uh, that um, when you measure with a couple of different detector types, they meet in the middle, so to speak, um, that, that you they come to agree um, after you, you've applied any uh, corrections that are needed to give you confidence that you're actually measuring um, and reporting the doses accurately. So the diodes that we have, the D1V and the D1H, um, are the same diode, just in two different orientations. So the, the horizontal D1H is designed really for putting into um, uh, phantoms or machined out uh, solid water slabs. And the D1V is the, the vertical orientation for scanning. They're both unshielded diodes. Um, they have a one millimeter diameter spot size. There are correction factors for uh, mega voltage beams available. Um, I know there were, uh, and specifically, there were two publications in 2014 that looked at both measured and calculated factors um, for the diodes. And this is uh, from Papa Constantopoulos et al. in PMB. Strengths of the diodes is that it is a well-established technology. 
Um, it can be used for scanning. It does have minimal volume averaging and low angular dependence. Um, this is the curve here, the, the green squares um, for the D1V out of Paolo Francescan's paper, which I showed this plot earlier. Limitations is that diodes are not water equivalent, so they do require corrections for those perturbations, um, and there is a little bit of angular dependence for these diodes too. But as long as you're using them in the orientation um, perpendicular to the beam, um, that the face of the diode is perpendicular to the beam, um, then you don't have to worry about that angular dependence. For the scintillation detectors, whoops, I, my image is covering up the, uh, the term words there. Sorry about that. Um, they are organic scintillating, scintillating materials um, and can be either one by one or one by three, depending on which version you're getting. Um, they're water equivalent, um, four megavoltage photon and electron beams, um, but they do require a correction for the Cherenkov effect. Um, this is the light that's produced in the um, optical fiber that transfers the scintillation light to the optical detectors. Um, much like the, um, the glow in the reactor pool from the, the radiation. So um, I'll, we have a method for correcting for that, but it does require that correction. And it does have to be carefully done. Um, it's also not an absolute dosimeter. It can't be sent in for calibration. Um, so it, you can give it a reference dose, a known dose, and get your output in, uh, in terms of dose relative to that. Um, and you would periodically have to recalibrate it um, with that cross calibration um, in an, a reference field um, as the material accumulates dose. It is a plastic fiber. And so like um, like all other plastics, it does tend to yellow a bit as it uh, receives radiation. Um, and so as the fiber is dosed, as it's aged, it does change how that, um, it, it changes how much light is transmitted down the fiber from that scintillation um, portion at the end. And it can change the spectrum slightly. And so that's why uh, you have to recalibrate occasionally. The method we use for the Cherenkov correction is a two-channel chromatic correction that's based on a publication from Matthew Guyot um, from 2011. Um, basically, we're looking at our, our scintillator is a blue scintillator, and it, um, it has a, a characteristic scintillation curve shown here. Um, Cherenkov is a broad spectrum light, and so it crosses um, the, the range of measurement of the optical light that we're collecting. So we split this into a blue section and a green section of the spectrum um, and, and use those two portions of the spectrum to be able to correct the, the measurement for um, this Cherenkov light, which is essentially a stem effect on the detector. So to characterize this, um, you do two measurements with a, a larger field. This is the calibration slab that we send with the, the X-ray and W1. Um, the W2 has a smaller um, jig that would be used in a water tank, um, or there are a couple other methods, um, rectangular field method that can be used for that one. But essentially, um, the method in general terms is um, that you would deliver a dose to the scintillation detector or to the scintillator portion um, with the, the fiber coming straight out of the field in what we call the minimum fiber configuration. And then you would keep the dose to the scintillator the same but irradiate more of that fiber, have it wrapped through this channel instead for what we call the maximum fiber configuration. And in this way, by keeping the dose to the scintillator the same, but changing the fiber in the field, you're changing only this Cherenkov correct, or um, light, the amount of Cherenkov. So if this shifts up, then we get a shift in the signal in both the green channel and the blue channel. And we can calculate a correction factor based on the relative change of this, what we call signal channel, um, compared to the, the mostly Cherenkov channel. And that correction factor is then used for subsequent measurements. If you want to give it a dose calibration, um, that's a second um, set of measurements on uh, after the, the CLR measurements. And that would be in, um, this is, has a 10 by 10 field uh, marked out, but in a, a field um, of known dose at a known, uh, known configuration, I guess, depth and field size. Um, give it that dose, and then uh, your output can be in terms of dose. So the W1 scintillator was the first generation. It's been out for probably six years now, maybe. Um, 
It's a one millimeter diameter, three millimeter long active simulation region. And um, the TRS-483 publication has a lot of tables of uh, various beam energies, um, correction factors as field sizes decrease. And it's always really fun to pull this out actually because this, the W1 is the only detector that shows a uh, value of unity for the beam quality correction across the board. Um, they don't show data. Um, if you're looking for data for a small field for uh, one of the detectors and it shows these dashed lines, um, that's really indicating that either the detector was not stable enough or the uncertainty in the measurement was too high and they didn't feel the writers of this um, joint publication didn't feel that it was appropriate to use that detector in those small fields. Um, strengths, we just talked about KQ is one. Oh, goodness, I messed up my bullets there too. Um, KQ is one. It's water equivalent for MV photons and electrons. Um, it hasn't shown dose rate or energy dependence. Um, it has a negligible temperature dependence. Um, so if you're just using at it um, at calibration uh, conditions, room temperature type conditions, then you don't have to correct for any temperature dependence. Um, limitations of that W1 is that it was not de uh, designed for scanning or for large fields. Um, it, um, it really was designed just to be a point detector for output factor type measurements. Um, it has a low SNR just because it's a, a low signal type device. And so it has a higher uncertainty out of the fields in those tails. Um, it'll do the opposite of the diode though. You'll bump up against the noise floor. And so it will actually look like a higher signal out of field usually than it, it really ought to be um, with the W1. As we mentioned, it does. it's not an absolute dosimeter. It can't be sent to a calibration lab for, for calibration. Um, so it, it requires cross calibration with something in-house, uh, reference dose and, and occasional recalibration. The other issue that we've found uh, with the, the simulator is once you're used to it and you're comfortable with it, um, it's a, a very nice detector to have, but optical signal measurements are outside of our general comfort zone as physicists. We're used to ion chambers, we're used to diodes, and now suddenly stepping into optics uh, takes us back to college, um, <laughs> remembering what was going on troubleshooting that is a little bit tougher for some users. Once you, once you get used to it, um, it's, uh, it's quite easy to use, but, but the um, learning curve is potentially a little steeper just because it's not your usual detector. With the W2, this has been out for a little over a year now, I think. Um, this one has uh, improved optics, so we were able to go down to a one by one millimeter um, fiber option as well as a one by three. It does have dedicated electronics, um, so we call this the Max SD. Um, this is an optics and electronics collection unit, so you don't need to use the W2 with a separate electrometer. It's all built in with the Max SD. The W1 um, has the optics at the end of the fiber, but no electrometer, so it has to be used with a two channel electrometer like our Supermax in order to do that two color subtraction. Um, the Max SD, um, or the, Part of the reason we were able to go down to that one by one simulator is both because we improved some of our optics, but also because by building this all together in one controlled box um, without extra cables to take this signal from one point to another, um, we were able to decrease the electronic noise and therefore get the, um, the signal um, accurately enough at these small, small signal values um, to get those tails uh, measured properly, as well as um, being uh, allowing us to go to that decreased detector size. You can perform point mode measurements directly with the Max SD. You don't need to hook it up to anything else. It has a web-based interface for uh, performing those CLR corrections, dose calibration, um, point dose measurements. But then it also can do a, a very fast uh, application of that Cherenkov correction for every 10 millisecond integration that it, it's uh, acquires um, and convert that value into an analog output um, so it can output a current that's a Cherenkov and dose corrected current to your um, water tank electrometer. And so you can scan with this within your water tank um, just treating it from the water tank's perspective, treating it like a diode. You don't apply bias to it, but it will return current when the, um, uh, the beam is turned on. The 
there's a question of can I share the PowerPoint? I will. Uh, you'll, you will see it again in the recording. I don't think I will send out the slides from that. Um, the Max SD is used inside the room. It is not intended to be used outside the room. Um, it's, it needs to be right the right at the end of the fiber. So you'd have a four meter fiber plugged into the back of the Max SD. Um, then, so it, it it functions just fine on the end of the treatment couch. Um, we have also done some research with MR Linac centers um, where we've made them some five meter long fibers to get the Max SD outside the five Gauss line. Um, and there are some publications, I think, out of the University of Wisconsin um, about their use of that um, with their view ray system. Strengths of the W2 are identical to the W1. Um, and then we've, we've just basically eliminated a couple of these limitations that we had with the first generation device. The X-ray in A26, oh, there's one more question. Is it shielded for neutrons? Um, there, it's not shielded specifically for neutrons. There is a little bit more noise that you get with the higher energies. Um, it is ideal, um, designed ideally for the 6MV and 6MV FFF beams. Um, you can measure in the higher energy um, ranges, but the, um, there is a little bit additional noise at the photodiode, um, potentially due to neutrons. So ionization chambers, this is the one that I mentioned is the, the old standard, but uh, finally working properly. The x ray in A26 was designed as a result of the thesis work from Jessica Miller, um, now Jessica Snow, uh, at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And she was looking into the behavior of all of the microionization chambers that were on the market at the time. Um, not just standard imaging, but every ion chamber manufacturer. When you get down to these very small um, chambers, every single one of them was showing um, odd behavior when you looked at the polarity effects um, and ion recombina recombination. Um, sometimes um, unrealistically odd. Uh, correction values, like values above one for ion recombination. And um, the, uh, the cause of this, in Jessica found um, the, that she traced this to an actual mismatch of the conductance between the um, central electrode of the microionization chamber and the guard uh, and the shell. So any mismatch in conductance there will cause a slight change in your um, electric field within the ionization chamber, and that will change um, how, how and how much you um, collect the, the ions that are created within there. And that was causing some of this behavior. Um, so from her results, um, we were able to design the A26. Oh, I remember what I was going to say on that previous slide. Um, the, this is also the reason why um, if you talk to one of the calibration labs right now, if you're using anything other than the A26, um, they will tell you that when you're measuring with your microionization chamber, you really should not be applying a polarity correction to it. You should use it only at the polarity at which it was calibrated. Um, because this varies for all of the other microionization chambers, it varies not only model to model, but chamber to chamber within that model. Um, so it, it's not a reproducible effect um, or a stable effect necessarily. So the A26 was designed to meet these reference class conditions um, for an ionization chamber as defined by uh, the IEC and TG51. Um, so there is a question. The A16 was not replaced. Um, the A26 is just barely larger than the A16. The volume looks bigger, but the spot size is actually quite comparable. Um, so the, what we thought about when we were designing the A26, not only was matching that conductance and um, between the, the collector, the guard, and the shell, so every part of this is now made out of the, the same 
um, batch of C552 conducting plastic. Um, we made the spot size as small as, or um, as small as we could. I guess that's under chamber volume. Um, it's a spherical spot size, so the orientation, whether you're scanning um, transverse to the chamber orientation or in line with it, um, your um, volume averaging is identical. It's spherical. Um, we modeled the electric fields to make sure that we had that shape um, accurately defined. Um, this is the smallest you're going to see a well-behaved chamber um, because this is the smallest you can machine manufacture um, a chamber of this type. Um, it is that it is slightly larger than the A16 um, in terms of the volume, but the spot size is less or less than a millimeter wider than the A16. So it's still quite a small chamber. Um, then we, what, the other thing we had to consider, of course, was what's the signal going to be? Will the signal to noise ratio be sufficient for the intended use? Um, and, and yes, it is, it's, it's comparable to the A16. So strengths of the A26, it is a reference class ion chamber designed to meet those uh, standards um, laid out by the, the test group. Um, the spot size is spherical, so it's independent of orientation. Your volume averaging is um, and it's familiar technology for most physicists. We're comfortable working in the realm of ion chambers. Um, and I forgot to, uh, I guess I said in reference class, and it's, it's small enough to measure these small fields um, stably. Limitations is that you, it's still an ion chamber. You're still perturbing the beam at the point of measurement just slightly by putting in something that is less dense than water. And so it will still require corrections to account for the fact that you're putting air volume in the beam. Um, the, sorry, I, I'll get back to the questions at the end. I'm distracting myself. Um, what about small X-ray fields? We've spent this whole time talking about megavoltage photon beams. Um, what about kilovoltage X-ray fields? Um, and the A20, if you're not familiar with it, is an absolutely fabulous little parallel plate chamber. Um, it's, it's designed to be used in an end-on format. So it's a less than two millimeter diameter collecting um, electrode in a parallel plate chamber uh, meant to be irradiated this way um, for small X-ray orthovoltage fields um, or um, skin therapy like Leipzig applicator or, um, or other applicators for skin treatments with um, brachytherapy sources or electronic brachytherapy sources. That's what it was designed for. It has excellent energy response um, going starting at uh, 20 kEV was the lowest that we tested um, all the way up to cobalt 60 at 1.25. So it's a wonderful, wonderful little chamber for small x-ray fields. Um, I've taken up a lot of your time. I don't want to take up a whole lot more, but it is important that when you're measuring small fields and small signals that you have a really good electrometer to go with it. Um, and we have a couple of wonderful options. Um, the Max 4000 Plus is a workhorse. It has been, um, it's a rock solid electrometer. We've been making electrometers for almost all of our 30 years and we are, uh, I have to say, we're really good at it. Um, so this is a very robust single channel electrometer. Um, the Supermax is the um, next is the higher level electrometer. It does have a touch screen. It has two channels with independent bias. Um, we have been able to give it just a one minute warm up um, and you're ready to make measurements. Both of these have excellent ranges, um, a little bit better low end resolution on the Supermax, um, but both have excellent ranges for small field measurements, either with ion chambers or with diodes. Um, and of course, the Supermax can be used with our W1 electrometer as well, or W1 detector. Um, the other thing to remember about these electrometers, um, both have an industry leading five year warranty. We make electrometers well, we know we make them well, would they last forever? Um, and so we, we stand behind that with our warranty as well. So thank you so much for your attention. Uh, it's kind of fun to, to talk about some of these topics. I know we don't have answers for everything, um, but we do have some wonderful options for you if you're looking at small fields. Um, and I'm happy to, to look through the questions. Um, now, if you have anything else to enter on questions, uh, please feel free to. 
Um, otherwise, we thank you for your attention. Let's see. Can the Max SD be used with a high energy beam? Yes, it can. You'll just get a little bit uh, noisier measurements um, just because of the, um, the scatter to the photodiodes. Is the W2MR compatible? Um, the, yes, so the fiber has no metal in it whatsoever. Um, it is just a plastic fiber. Um, and there have been measurements both in the um, Electa Unity as well as the Ray uh, MR Linux. Um, we do sell a, or we have, for those measurements, we have made a longer optical fiber. So it's a five meter fiber in order to get that max SD outside the five Gauss line. So we know to apply correction factors from for diodes um, for output factors, but what do you do when you're scanning a small field with a diode? Uh, it moves across a high signal and a low signal. Um, how do you correct the profiles? The thing to be aware um, when scanning with a diode is that outside the field, because of the lower energy, because it's primarily scatter outside the field, your diode may be reporting a slightly lower dose than is actually present. Um, so it, it may be, um, may behoove you to measure it as well with an, a small ion chamber or a simulator, something like that, or even film, um, just to ensure that the, um, the total area of the curve uh, matches um, and that, that you're, you're confident that those tails are, are uh, within an acceptable uncertainty. Strange behavior of the A16 was that due to the electric field. It's not actually due to the, well, sort of, it's due to a mismatch in the conductance between the um, metal electrode of the A16 and the conductive plastic that's used for the rest of that detector. And the strange behavior of microchambers is not limited to the A16. It's every microchamber on the market except for the A26. Um, and that was, um, oh golly, I'll have to go check and see if um, Jess, what Jess's publication was, but it was definitely covered in her thesis. She looked at the range of pinpoint chambers um, that were on the market. So is Cherenkov radiation overlapping with the light emitted by the scintillator? Yes, it is. Um, and so the separation of the two is um, essentially the, um, when we characterize that response, we look at how the signal magnitude in the green channel, which is primarily Cherenkov, changes relative to the change in the blue channel, which is primarily um, scintillation signal, but has Cherenkov in it. And from that, we create a correction uh, factor called the Cherenkov light ratio. Um, so then subsequent measurements, when you take a measurement, you, you um, correct, you subtract the Cherenkov from the blue channel by taking the green channel signal, multiplying by this correction factor, and then subtracting it from the, um, the blue signal. So that's how it's separated. Um, it's still in, it's uh, described a lot more in the, that publication um, that I cited. I think it, that was Francis Kahn, I think. Um, and I also have done a presentation on the simulator itself. Um, which you should be able to see in the website, um, the standard imaging website for past webinars. Uh, and I'll probably be giving another one of those uh, in about a month um, if you want to tune in for that one. Otherwise, we can certainly follow up with questions. Let's see. Are the chambers water resistant? Yes, they are. They are all uh, waterproof. Um, although the A20, I'm not sure. I would have to go check on that one. I don't know offhand if the A20 is waterproof. Um, does angular incident affect the CLR correction in the W1 and the W2? Um, that's a good question. It's not, um, it has not affected it uh, significantly when we were doing um, measurements and there was actually some other thesis work at the UW Madison, um, where they were looking at the stability of the spectrum um, with angular 
angular incidence, the magnitude of the Cherenkov does change slightly um, based on the directionality because of um, the way Cherenkov is produced. It actually has a, a preferential production angle of about 45 degrees. Um, and so if you if you have a significant amount of the fiber kind of aligned near that 45 degree point or in line with the beam, um, you're creating Cherenkov more in the direction of the fiber. And so you're channeling more of that Cherenkov down the fiber because we rely on total internal reflection down the fiber. Um, but you're also um, irradiating more of the fiber if you're if you're irradiating in that same direction as the fiber too. So um, it looks like um, there's a question about measuring output factors using the A16 and got different uh, factors than was expected. Um, suggestions, I would double check to make sure that you um, are using the right range on your electrometer. Um, and also potentially scan to make sure that you're centered in the field. Those would be the first things I would check. Um, can I comment on film dosimetry in small field? Film dosimetry is is good, um, but it's kind of a pain. Um, and if you are if you're measuring a, a larger field, then the, the film dosimetry is quite accurate in terms of the, the profile shapes. Um, you do still need to characterize the response of the film um, to the radiation so that you can convert that to dose. But the, the main limitation that I would warn you to keep an eye on um, with smaller fields is that depending on your scanner, there can be some light scatter from behind a, a say, a very small dot if you're looking at that in the scanner. Um, that decreases the signal or increases the amount of light that reaches your scanner just from the, the, um, the scatter within the scanner itself. And so it can artificially flatten or smear out your measured profile on an, an extremely small field. Um, for the most part, uh, it, it, you'll be fine above Oh, what is it? Maybe five millimeters, six millimeters. Um, but if you're getting down um, below that, then then you would really need to be careful. Um, check with a potentially with just a, a, a physically drawn dot as opposed to a measured radiation field. Um, but that would be my suggestion. So thank you everyone for your attention. I think that's the last question I have listed here. Uh, oh wait. I'm wrong. There's another one. It is very important to center the detector within the field, especially for small fields. Should you scan detectors across the field in both in-plane and cross-plane to find the maximum? Yes, I agree. Um, you definitely should do that. Thank you, everyone. I really do appreciate your attention here um, today. And it's... Uh, Wonderful to have all the interest in small field detectors. If you want more information, I have uh, our website, standardimaging.com, and uh, sales at standardimaging.com is another good, good way to contact us. Um, we're happy to talk to you about small fields. We're happy to talk to you about the strengths and limitations of our detectors. Um, we, we're very open and honest with what we've got. Um, we want you to know what we have. We want you to understand how to use it properly. Um, and ultimately treat patients with the, the care and the accuracy that you, you would want to be treated, we would want to be treated um, if we were to, to uh, need that as well. So thank you so much.